Good evening, and thank you for coming to the uh, first in a series of uh, public workshops uh, designed to help us develop a strategy for creating a more humane LA. Uh, our host this evening, Bernard Parks, council member of District 8, may be running late and may not be able to make it, uh, but we want to uh, thank him for hosting this meeting and making it possible. He was very, very uh, uh, concerned that the first one and the one dealing with spay neuter was done in his district, so we want to thank him very much. Also want to thank uh, Channel 35, uh, Tony Agani and Ted Lynn and all of the team that's here uh, for helping us uh, record uh, this historic uh, uh, series of meetings uh, that uh, I think will prove that uh, is the, the, the shifting uh, of, uh, of the tide in LA and helping us come up with a, a strategy of working together to create a humane LA. Also want to thank uh, GS Security who's here this evening, the Human Relations Commission whose role I will explain in a little bit and the members of the staff of LA Animal Services and, of course, our distinguished panel, who will be introduced shortly. Uh, first, I want to explain uh, the purpose of, uh, of these workshops. Uh, Los Angeles is one of the largest uh, animal care and control organizations in the United States, uh, rescuing some 125 to 150 dogs and cats a day. And that's about 50,000 animals a year. Uh, how many people have been in Dodger Stadium? to try to wrap your mind around that number of 50,000 animals. Picture yourself sitting in the bleachers in a Dodger Stadium, and now picture a dog or a cat in every single seat <laughs> in that stadium. That's how many animals Animal Care Control uh, rescues and takes into its facilities every single year. Clearly, we have way too many dogs and cats in our community. Uh, and the city of Los Angeles was way ahead of the curve in understanding that and several years ago, under the uh, Hahn administration, uh, the city uh, established what has come to be known as the no-kill goal. And I think for the series of, uh, of workshops, it's important that we all understand what we mean by no-kill. And I've put a definition up here, and I, I really don't want, we're not going to be discussing it particularly or, or debating it this evening, uh, but if anybody has suggestions on how we can enhance this definition, uh, please get those to the department so that we can continue to work with it uh, uh, as we're going forward. But what I would ask is, uh, is, is there a level of agreement that if we look at no-kill as meaning LA Animal Services getting to the place where we are using the same criteria that a compassionate veterinarian or a loving pet guardian or owner uses to, to, to determine if and when an animal is euthanized. Is that a definition that we as a community could per, perhaps agree to? Does anybody have any major heartburn over that definition? Because what that definition then means is no kill means only terminally ill and injured animals and dangerously aggressive animals would be humanely euthanized. And no healthy or treatable animal would be euthanized or killed. Um, Clearly we're not there yet as a community, but as a community we have gone a long way in that direction. Over the last five years we've seen a 50% decrease in the numbers of dogs and cats euthanized. And in 2002 we saw a 22% decrease alone. Uh, unfortunately, year to date in 2008 we have seen an increase, the first increase in the number of dogs and cats euthanized in some five or six years in the city of Los Angeles. And there's a lot of uh, theories and conjecturing as to why that might be happening. We are certainly seeing more animals coming into our shelters this year, uh, uh, and, a, and an increase in the number of animals being released or surrendered into our shelter for reasons of moving and landlord and uh, reasons uh, associated or, or connected to the housing and foreclosure crisis. So a lot of the animal people are losing not only their homes but their pets. And, uh, and they're bringing them to the animal services in uh, record numbers compared to the previous years. And consequently, we're seeing an increase in the number of animals that are dying in our shelter. Uh, fortunately, our adoptions have been skyrocketing at the same time, uh, but not keeping pace. Uh, we've seen it. We're adopting nearly 25,000 dogs and cats a year, uh, which is an extraordinary number when you stop to think about it. Uh, but we are clearly on a treadmill. Uh, we're not adopting on animals fast enough uh, to keep up with the number of animals that are coming into our shelter. And I think I speak for all of us who work for LA Animal Services as well as all the organizations who do such fine work in trying to solve this problem, that we want to get off the treadmill. We want to see some strategies that really and truly make a difference. 
So that's the purpose of the workshops, uh, the 11 workshops that we have scheduled between now and December. Uh, what we're wanting to do in these workshops is explain what the city and other wonderful organizations in the community are doing and have done to address the pet overpopulation problem, and then identify what more we can do to achieve no-kill and make LA the most humane city in the United States. Throughout the series of workshops, we will discuss a variety of strategies to help achieve no-kill, and tonight's strategy, of course, is stated, what could we be doing more effectively? I just want to very quickly uh, express the, or explain the history of it, Los Angeles' commitment to spay and neuter. Uh, the city first demonstrated uh, its commitment to spay and neuter on February 17, 1971, uh, 37 years ago, with the opening of the nation's first municipally run spay and neuter clinic, and that was in the uh, north central area of the city. That commitment was uh, quickly followed in 1973 with the opening of a spay neuter clinic in East Valley and another one in South LA. Two more clinics uh, were open in the 80s uh, in Harbor and West LA, or possibly West Valley. I'm a little unclear exactly which, uh, which community. But the city, for the longest period of time, had five municipal spay neuter clinics, uh, all up until 1991. Does anybody remember what happened in 1991? Uh, things were humming along wonderfully in the spay neuter area for the city. In 1991, the city had a budget crisis, and the response to the budget crisis was to close all five spay neuter clinics. Ironically, that was the same year that the Minnesota legislator, uh, legis legislation uh, submitted, uh, issued a, a study that found that for every one dollar invested in spay neuter programs, so $19 in animal control costs could be saved over 10 years. So could you imagine where we would be as a community if we had bitten the bullet in 1991 and continued our spay neuter efforts? In response to the clinic's uh, closures, to, to the clinic closures, the department developed several spay neuter voucher and coupon programs, which uh, uh, the, the panel this evening is going to be talking about in some detail. What is significant is that nearly half a million surgeries have been performed uh, thanks to the programs of LA, uh, of LA City since 1971, half a million animals. It's difficult to calculate this, what that savings means in terms of lives and money, <clears throat> but it is, it is conservatively estimated that 1.5 million unwanted animals <clears throat> were not born as a result of these programs, and over $300 million in shelter costs were saved. Clearly, spay and neuter is an important component of achieving no-kill, which is why we're discussing it this evening. Very quick, quickly, I want to talk about just three initiatives that the city is involved in uh, with respect to spay and neuter. We are in the final stages of concluding the uh, construction of several spay and neuter clinics. When it's all said and done, the city will now have seven spay and neuter clinics strategically placed throughout all of Los Angeles. So the most we've ever had is five. Uh, by this time next year, we should have seven operational clinics. We're also funding uh, mobile spay neuter uh, efforts. And of course, the Amanda Foundation is here this evening, and uh, we're in the process of negotiating, negotiating a renewal of their contract to continue that at very, very important uh, service to the city of uh, Los Angeles. And uh, we're also, it, so the city is already committed and grasp this. I'm not sure how many Angelinos really know this, but we spend $2.4 million a year on spay and neuter. What other city in the world commits that level of uh, resources to spay and neuter? And the city has been doing that for years. The last thing, and the most recent thing, I guess, the, that the city has done uh, is uh, earlier this year, the city council uh, passed and the mayor uh, signed into law the city spay and neuter ordinance. Uh, it went into effect earlier this year. There was a seven-month grace period for Angelinos to get their pets spayed and neutered. And as of October 1st, Angelinos whose pets are not spayed and neutered and do not meet the, the uh, exemptions in the law will be in violation of that spayed and neuter law. So we encourage people to uh, comply with the law and get their animals spayed and neutered. What's interesting about uh, that spayed and neutered ordinance is that it was almost 37 years to the, to the day, uh, it's actually just five days off from the opening of the first uh, city uh, shelter back in 1971 that we, that we signed the spay neuter ordinance into law. Uh, the, the Humane LA workshops 
are going to be facilitated by the LA Human Relations Commission. And I've been asked, why, Ed, are you asking the Human Relations Commission to come in and facilitate these meetings? I think if you understand the history of the Human Relations Committee, uh, Commission forgive me, and uh, the role that they have played in this community, you'll understand why uh, I, I asked them to join uh, this discussion and why they were uh, uh, willing to do so. The Human Relations Commission was formed in 1965 in response to the Watts riots uh, to help rebuild strong human relations and ensure every LA resident has the opportunity to fully and equally participate in the welfare of city government. The Human Relations Commission is committed to reducing community conflict and tension and building strong intergroup relations. So that's why we're wanting the Human Relations Commission to help. It is my hope that these workshops will help elevate the public discourse and, relate, and result in the creation of meaningful community input and, and programs that help us solve uh, the pet overpopulation problems that so plague us. So who better to help us, help guide us into creating a more humane LA than the Human Relations Commission? This has been their charter since 1965. So please help me welcome and thank Rabbi Freeling for his willingness to help us uh, through these discussions. Actually, I'm here representing our dog, Pearl, who is uh, the second rescue animal that my wife, Lori, and I have had. And um, it's, uh, it's really a, a great joy for all of us who are on the staff of the City Human Relations Commission to, to partner with Animal Services, not only in this particular project of 11 workshops, but in other instances as well. Uh, with us this evening is Victoria Minetta, who has been spending a considerable amount of time, uh, not on assignment, but really because she is so vitally interested in the well-being of animals throughout the city. And the role that she's going to be playing is cheerleader? Yes. Okay, that's good. What actually she was going to be doing, but we've, uh, we've changed it because of the number of you who are here or those who are the number of people who aren't here. We originally thought that questions would be written and Victoria, among other things, would sift through them and see which ones are duplicates and, and try to cut down the volume of, of questions to be asked in that way. But she was the first to uh, acknowledge the fact that in as much as this is a rather small group, uh, we ought to keep it as intimate as possible. And with that in mind, um, I don't know who you are. Steffi Davis. Steffi, raise your hand. Anyone seated behind Steffi is now going to move forward. She's Kathy. Kathy, that's it. So, seriously, come forward. Come, 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 come. come. <laughs> we charge more for the back seats anyhow. Mm -hmm. Sit on the front rows, sit around. That's good. Um, there are... There are some guidelines or ground rules that we're going to try to follow. Uh, most especially, this is an opportunity for us to exchange opinions, but to really derive as much information as we can, which we can share with the community after we've left here. Therefore, whether you have an opportunity to speak, uh, I would hope that you would speak as briefly as possible. Ideally, you would be asking a question, perhaps, of, of one of the panelists, or maybe of Ed, or maybe amongst yourselves, but make this as informative and make this as much of a dialogue as possible. And with that in mind, I'd remind you that Martin Buber once taught that more times than not, we are involved in monologue. We've heard Ed. You're listening to me. We're not listening to you. So give the speaker an opportunity to speak. Don't challenge, but really absorb that which has been said. If you want to jot some notes for yourself so that when you have a chance to be heard, uh, we will be hearing you. But let's make this as constructive and as positive an experience as we can. With reference to the women's choir, <laughs> This is a women's choir, isn't it? It's been a long time to sing. The lead singer <laughs> is 
Brenda Van den Bosch. Did I do that right? Yes, you did. Wonderful. Thank you. But there's a mistake on this because it says that you've been with the department for 27 years, which means that you came as a Girl Scout as a volunteer. Thank you. Yes. Yes, I love that. <laughs> And uh, you know, with all that time that she's had the opportunity to see the department uh, really move from, from one strength to another, you can imagine the experiences that she's had. Uh, but most importantly for this evening's program, she is responsible now for all of the department's spay neuter programs throughout the city. Uh, Susan Taylor uh, represents Actors and Others for Animals an organization which was founded in 1971. Uh, she um, began her association with uh, the group about 35 years ago. All these numbers are wrong. I was only five. And, that's okay. <laughs> and um, she, for the last 10 years, has been the executive director and continues to do so. Terry Austin, whose organization has already been mentioned, namely the Amanda Foundation, has been spending more than two decades rescuing, rescuing animals all over Los Angeles. Um, it says here that the Amanda Foundation created and runs the most successful mobile spay-neuter program in the country, last year performing more than 7,000 surgeries. Now, the numbers you mentioned are our numbers, the city's numbers, right? So in other words, they're doing more so the volume is unbelievable. Truly is. Okay, we have to deal with that. Uh, Lori Weiss uh, represents the downtown dog rescue. What happens if it's a cat? We hope the cats do. I hope so. And rabbits. That, you know, Human Relations Commission does not discriminate between dogs and cats. Bunnies. <laughs> and bunnies and horses and other people. Right, good. Anyhow, most important, and Ed mentioned that which is happening economically in which people, uh, because of the, the mortgage crisis, people who never ever thought that they might be homeless find themselves homeless. And uh, what Lori and her organization is doing is paying special attention uh, to the needs of homeless people and their animals uh, to be sure that, that in, in any way possible uh, we don't separate one from the other because those of us who are owners of animals or actually parents of animals know how important they are in our lives, probably more important than we are in theirs. And finally, there's Judy Mancuso, uh, who represents California Healthy Pets. She is wearing the most colorful of the outfits tonight. <laughs> she has spent more than 20 years rescuing animals, finding them homes, and leading efforts to close down animal hoarders. Talk about that a little bit during your remarks because I don't know what that means. In any event, that's our panel. They're going to spend some time talking to you on the subject, perhaps some cross-conversation if in fact they want to get in their own little dialogue. And when you've indicated that you are through talking, <laughs> I'll be up here to see to it that all of us have a chance to chime in. Therefore, the former Girl Scout, Brenda. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, like the rabbi said, my name is Brenda Vandenbosch, and I am the Spaniard Coordinator for the Department of Animal Services, and I started back in 1981, so I've been around for a while. The department currently has 11 spay and neuter programs, four of which are for the general public, and the general public means those animals that were not adopted out of our animal care centers. Now, the first one that I'm going to hit on started back in 1991, and it actually started as a feral cat discount coupon program and we decided to go ahead and incorporate um, the general public's dogs and cats. And this was basically based on the closure of our own spay and neuter clinics. So this program has been just, I want to say, just a staple for, what, how many years? Is that 17 years it's been around? And it is one of the simplest programs. The only qualifier for the discount coupon program is being a city resident, and that's it. There's no income cap, there's nothing. It's just being a city resident. You can obtain the discount coupons at any one of our six animal care and control centers. And also, I want to make special mention here, we also partner with 
this year, I believe, I think Terry has the list, 25 rescue organizations. They are wonderful. They actually not only distribute the discount coupons for us, but they also help advertise the program. Now, the discount coupons are valued at $30 off the cost of sterilization at a, par at a participating veterinary hospital, which means if the veterinarian charges $60, then you're only going to pay $30 for that sterilization. And I tell you, it's, it's just the easiest, easiest program. You, um, like I said, you go to, to your public counter. I'm just a mess tonight, all right. You go to your public counter at the Animal Care Center. Ask for a discount coupon, they will give you the discount coupon along with a list of the veterinary hospitals that participate. You call, you schedule an appointment, and you get your animal sterilized. Now the next one is our Felix program. Now the Felix program is, it's, I want to say it's unique because it's the same as the discount coupon program, but the department has always focused since 1991 on feral cats. We want to make that perfectly clear. Feral cats have, have always been incorporated into our spay and neuter programs. But with the Felix program, it was really making a point to separate the general public animals from the feral cats. And Felix is the acronym for feral education and love instead of extermination. Just because these cats don't have a traditional home doesn't mean they don't deserve the right to live out a full natural life. And you don't have to belong to a rescue organization. You can actually go in. I did it myself. I have two feral cats that I trapped and I got sterilized using the discount coupons. And what you do is the same thing. You go to your public counter at the Animal Care and Control Center, you obtain a discount coupon, you take the animal to get sterilized, and then you return the animal back to its colony. And that's called trap, neuter, and return. And we have a lot of organizations that also assist with that. And I do have a list that's in the back that has a list of all the uh, rescuers that assist us with this, and it says feral next to them. So really utilize this. Think of that feral cat as an addition to your family, even though you'll never be able to get close to it. Just think of it in the terms that this animal has a right to live out there. Just because it doesn't live in your home doesn't mean it doesn't have the right to survive. Okay, and Ed said give the nuts and bolts. So, you know, I know I got the five minutes. So I'm trying to move through these. And the last one is our free certificate program. Back in 2001, we were going to convert our discount coupons to a program that was going to be for those individuals that were in need. And City Council was really, really great. What they did is they said, keep your program. Your program's working. Here's an additional amount of money. Develop a program for those particular um, individuals who are having a more difficult time. So with the free certificate program, it basically operates the exact same way as the discount coupons. You can obtain a free certificate at your uh, your local at the public counter at your local animal care and control center, and it's valued at seventy dollars for the entire cost of sterilization. Which means if you have a male cat, or you have a, a hundred and fifty pound Rottweiler, that sterilization is going to be free to you, and your income cap level is forty thousand per year per household. And it also includes senior citizens and the permanently disabled. They also need to um, be in that particular income cap. And it's really, really a great program. I, I really wish that people would utilize this program. It's out there. It's available to them. And it is so. It is actually so simple to use. Um, <coughs> with the free with the free certificate program, those individuals that do get them. There may be extra costs at the veterinary hospital that's outside the cost of sterilization, and that would be at your own cost, but those fees are actually minimal. They're totally going to outweigh the cost of a regular sterilization. For instance, a 150-pound rot runner will cost you $300. If you get the free certificate, it will cost you nothing. So I strongly urge those individuals that qualify for the program to get the free certificates and to use them. You know, over the years, um, and basically the past five years, you've seen the surgeries go up. We've had 35,000, few little minor problems back in 2002, 2003. We've retweaked tweaked the programs. Right now, we're currently at over 40,000 animals for all our department's spay and neuter programs per year. 
I mean, that's an amazing amount when you actually look at who's utilizing these programs, the amount of animals that otherwise wouldn't get sterilized, they're now getting sterilized. So if you do get a discount coupon, you do get a free certificate, use it. It's out there, it's available to you. And I love the ordinance because it's not just the law, but it's actually the best, best gift you can give your animal. Thank you. Uh, well, my name is Sue Taylor and I'm the Executive Director of Actors and Others for Animals and we were founded in 1971 by Richard Basehart and his wife and others in the entertainment industry uh, because they uh, wanted to try to use their celebrity status to focus uh, media attention on the plight of animals. Now we've had our name uh, mangled many ways over the years. Uh, the one that I certainly like the best is um, uh, Let's see, what is it? Animals and Others for Actors. That's the, that's the one. We go by any name, but uh, we, we got into the spay neuter business because early on uh, they actually had taken on uh, a shelter, had used a shelter and they were uh, rescuing animals. But the problem comes with the shelter is that at some point in time you have way more animals coming in and you have to make that decision of which animals at what time need to be put down. And nobody wanted to make that decision. So they thought, what is the best way to try to cure that? And that was in spay neuter. And that is our main focus. We are a financial subsidy organization. We do not take in any animals. We don't adopt them. We don't have a shelter. We don't have a foster. We help people financially afford spay neuter. So, because the council has just arrived and he has someplace else to go to the Certainly. Well, Thank you, Sue. As I had predicted earlier, uh, the council member has uh, made it, and so please help me welcome council member Bernard Parks, who is supposed to be Thank you very much. Sue, I'd asked him not to do that. I to do that. <laughs> Once you got started, I said I'll wait until, until it was over, but I do have to go somewhere. Though. But I just wanted to stop by and welcome you to the 8th District. Uh, we're very pleased uh, that you've chosen this location. It's uh, one of the few constituent centers that we have in the city of LA is like a mini city hall. Uh, we are very pleased that about eight to ten city agencies work on the second floor and my office is on the first floor where we end up with a really uh, cutting down a number of people's uh, needs in the community. In fact, we have people often traveling as far from the valley here for building permits than rather than go through downtown. So it's a tremendous workload here providing services and it gives uh, the community something to be very, very proud of. It's something also that we use for a great deal of community meetings like this, in addition to our neighborhood councils and a variety of things uh, like that. We, we are very pleased that this uh, workshop is being done in this community because the educational aspect of it is very important to us. Uh, we, we believe, I don't know if it's true, but we believe we probably lead the league in uh, stray animals. Uh, I think we lead the league in violent and vicious stray animals. Uh, I think also we probably lead the lead in uh, what, uh, what the community commonly refers to as wild animals. And we probably lead the lead in, in injuries of human beings by animals. So I think those are kind of our sense that why we need to have this kind of training and understanding. But also what is important is that there's something that also goes in the community about people believing because of a lack of training that uh, they think something harmful happens to their dog if it's neutered or they believe that uh, it's not, quote, manly to have your dog neutered. And so those are the kind of things that we have this ongoing breeding dogs who are on the street. And the issue is, is that it's uh, uh, not a very good situation if you happen to be attacked by a dog or frightened of dog. I'm frightened to do death of dogs. I wouldn't leave a building if a dog was outside. So I, I don't want to be the person that someone says, that's the first time he ever bit someone. <laughs> that's, what I, that's, the, that's what I try to avoid all my life. And so uh, the issue is, is that uh, it is important that we give the training and that we continue to get out in the community. And Ed, you've got to remind me, what is the program we actually go out and educate the public from door to door? Our canvassing program. Canvassing program. And we were very pleased to help fund that because Again, we believe this community needs that kind of education more than any others because you can tell from uh, the clientele and such that we deal with animals. We feel very good that very shortly it's taken us 
five years to unravel what we think were some mistakes made in the planning process, but we're going to have a new animal regulation site that's going to be in the area of 62nd, just uh, west of Western. Uh, what was unfortunate is that uh, prior administration in this office had allowed that site to be uh, placed on Western, which was right in the middle of a, of a, uh, a brand new thriving furniture business. So we thought it was a little weird to have an animal regulation site in the middle of a furniture business. So it's taken us five years to unravel him in the domain and move it to a piece of property that the city already owned, uh, which is at 62nd, I believe, in St. Andrews. So that is moving now 100 miles an hour so we can get that site because if there's any place in the city that needs a new animal regulation site, it's uh, the 8th District. And even though we have people that, when we had the legal problems uh, in, at the original site, that came to us and said, why don't you just give it to another district and it will be close proximity. And we said, no, we're going to have an animal regulations facility in the 8th District where it's needed and we're not going to ask our residents to travel to the 9th or the 15th or some other district. So uh, we are very pleased with uh, how it come, came out has just taken way too long to get that done. So we're looking forward to the, uh, the groundbreaking and eventual ribbon cutting. But I just wanted to come by and welcome you and thank you for Animal Services bringing this type of information and thank our panel for coming on. I'm sure you could be home watching reruns of something. <laughs> it is important that uh, all parts of the community have an opportunity to hear about these issues uh, and unfortunately in my community that I represent, so many things can be solved by training and education, uh, whether we're talking about diseases, whether we're talking about uh, crime, a variety of things, and the big issue is how do we get that information in the hands of those who can use it most, and then also, uh, uh, even though we feel at times we have limited resources, what's unfortunate is when we have times when there's resources we don't use them. So it's a constant educational program to let people know what's available in the community. So I wanted to stop by and say thank you. Thank you, Ed. And Rabbi, thank you for being here. Yes, if there's any conflicts during the meeting, he will. <laughs> thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Please continue. <laughs> I would just like to very quickly thank uh, the council member for coming this evening and also thank him for all the support that he has lent the department during this very difficult uh, fiscal year and budget process. Uh, the council member heads up the finance committee. He also sits on the uh, public safety committee and his role on city council. Uh, he's been extraordinary in his support of animal welfare issues and I just want to publicly thank him. money. So we get a lot of phone calls every single day and we are one of the only organizations that actually ha works and has people answering the phone live Monday through Friday from 9 to 4. And oh, we have several, pro we work in five counties so we get quite a few calls a day and our number one mission is spay neuter. Number two, we also help people who have emergency medical uh, situations and help with their uh, veterinary bills. We have one person that's devoted to that. And then recently, we added a new program, which is called Spay California. I don't know if any of you are uh, familiar with uh, Spay USA, um, but they are sort of uh, making each of the states. They're trying to divide everything into statewide uh, ones, and we are now Spay California. And we've hired a person uh, whose only job is to do that, and she's quite busy because she has to, to research uh, all the uh, different veterinarians in the state. She has to answer the phone, and she has to put it all down to get our website up. And I am quite happy to say that our website did go up on July 23rd. So uh, www.spaycalifornia.org <coughs> will give you a listing of, uh, we're calling them now affordable veterinarians in California. But for our programs, as I said, we have quite a few. We uh, subsidize spay neuter surgeries. So people call in and they will tell us what type of an animal they have and where they live. And depending on what type of an animal it is, if it's a pit bull, they will fall under our free pit bull program, which we have been doing since 1999. And we will pay up to three uh, pit bulls free of charge. At, and we have about 160 veterinarians that uh, we work with, and we will try to get them to one in their area. Now, if it is a, uh, a dog of, of another breed, we will help subsidize that, and it, uh, it really depends on uh, the cost of uh, the veterinarian. 
Now, I guess I should go back and say we are obviously out there to help the low and fixed income individual. But we don't have the luxury of seeing who's on the other end of the phone. So we never know who it is that we're actually helping. But as we like to say, the animal got spayed or neutered. In the last uh, eight years, uh, our program, I was adding it up today, uh, we've done 111,017 uh, facilitated spay neuters in eight years' time. And additionally, uh, we also did a thousand rabbits. We've done, uh, we did do two goats this year, and uh, we do rats. If it could be spay or neutered, uh, we will help. Um, we also distribute the city spay neuter coupons. Uh, we also do cats, uh, and we do feral cats. We distribute the program, I mean the coupons, or uh, uh, we uh, we subsidize uh, the cost of the of the surgery. Uh, back in 1999, uh, we were part of the coalition to end pet overpopulation along with Terry and quite a few of the other major organizations here in Southern California. And I'm, you know, I think we're all very proud, aren't we, Terry, to say that we were really the, uh, we put the groundwork into effect for the, the, the new ordinance that just came out because what we were able to do is make the license differential so that you had $100 for an unaltered animal and $10 uh, for uh, an altered uh, one. And uh, that really uh, helped the spay-neuter situation. Uh, now, what I like to say about spay-neuter, too, is, is sort of um, in, the last, in the last three months, we've seen a very big rise in the veterinarian costs for spay-neuter. So it is, I do want to congratulate the city on their services because um, veterinarian fees are going way up. And while, you know, the coupon may cover, as, as, as Brenda says, uh, you know, the cost of the spay-neuter, many veterinarians add a, a, quite a few different charges. And we at Actors and Others don't pay that. We only pay or help with, uh, with the spay-neuter. Um, no other programs that we have. Oh, I, I do want to tell you about State California. The, uh, the, the site has been up, as I said, since July uh, 23rd, and here in, in Los Angeles we've had uh, 448 hits to the, to the website in that 12-day period, uh, people looking for uh, affordable spay-neuter in, uh, in the Los Angeles area. So you can see, we can see that the, um, the need is out there. Uh, over the years, we uh, also are, are very proud that we have associated ourselves or worked with other organizations such as the Amanda Foundation, uh, pet assistance and such, and we've done many uh, local uh, spay neuter, uh, and, and Lori, we've worked with Lori to do many uh, uh, local spay neuter um, sites. And I think that's important that the groups can work together and with the city in, in helping spay neuter. Uh, it is the, we feel it is the answer, it is the foundation upon, on which we are going to stop euthanasias or which we're going to, uh, uh, you know, better our communities. Um, I guess I really am um, ending in, a set, in the middle of a sentence there. Uh, I just wanted to say something also to what the councilman said, too bad he's not here. Uh, there's been a new um, a study out on aggression in dogs, and, you know, because we do, you know, the pit bulls and we've done Rottweilers uh, free of charge, thinking that they are the ones that are most prone to aggression. But there is actually a new study out that says that the, the dog most prone to aggression, I don't know if any of you could guess, is the dachshund. And that is followed by the Chihuahua and then the Jack Russell Terrier. Um, Last year, I do want to say, we also had a program where we thought we were going to do big and small because we've, all, we've done pit bulls since 1999. We thought, wouldn't it be nice if, you know, we balanced it and we decided to do chihuahuas. And let me tell you, I think they are, if not the, the, the number one, they've got to be the number two breed in Los Angeles because uh, we, it, it, within, it was just a six-month program and we went way over budget on that and we were getting calls right and left. So, um, there is a new movie coming out, uh, I don't know what it's called, Beverly Hills Chihuahua. So, yeah, so we are also uh, gearing up that we will get a lot more calls. And we have been receiving a lot more calls in the last uh, uh, three, uh, three months or so. And so, um, we're, we're very happy too to uh, refer, we are a referral service as well, we refer over to the, to the Amanda Foundation's free uh, Mobile, mobile van and, um, uh, and to the city to get the coupons when, when we run out. 
which is often. Um, uh, so um, that's it for, for what we do for, uh, for Stay Neuter. Hi, I'm Judy Mancuso, um, and um, I've been doing animal rescue uh, for over 20 years. And, you know, it was always hard to find a good home, and uh, primarily I did cat rescue, and uh, people thought that it was okay to feed cats to coyotes, and it just seemed like um, so many people were not the perfect home, and that it was such a large problem uh, that I wanted to do something else, and maybe try to affect the sober population a different way instead of being out with my traps and trapping the ferals that actually live with me versus the ones that I left out there. But that's a whole nother story. And uh, to address uh, the rabbi's question as well about the animal hoarding, uh, through the years I, I had a full-time job as an IT manager and so, you know, I rescued weekends, I fostered, I trapped and whatnot, and um, there was times that I did trap ferals and was looking for a place to go with them besides putting them out where I knew they'd get hit by a car or eaten by a coyote. And um, I found a rescue out, someone referred me in Valley Center, and it was called Rancho Lots of Cats. And, uh, you know, I don't trust these types of situations, so I went to see for myself if it would be suitable for the cats. And I went out there, and a woman named Annette uh, ran it. There was about 100 cats, and they were well taken care of. And I left the ferals behind, and I started sending donations to them uh, on a monthly basis because I felt that since I brought these cats there, I wanted to make sure they got the medical care. Well, years passed, and I hadn't been out there, but I had continued to send donations. And I got a call from the San Diego Animal Control, and they said, you know, is this Judy Mancuso? Yes. Uh, have you ever donated to Rancho Lots of Cats? Yes. Um, well, we're about to shut them down and euthanize all the animals on the property. Do you have any affiliation with them? Do you want to you know, step up and help in any way, and I went, oh my gosh, right? So I went to the property, and it was everything that the animal control officer had described to me. It was a field of cat feces and urine, and, you know, we're outside, and the stench was so bad, you know, your nose burned, right? You know, you're outside, there's a breeze, but yet the smell was so bad. So I left and um, I called the animal control officer because she told me she would not meet me there. The woman who was the owner and taking charge of it since Annette had an accident and was no longer the caretaker of these animals, uh, uh, they had a very bad relationship obviously with animal control. This, this woman, Donna Betancourt is her name. And so anyway, I called the animal control officer and I said, I'm on board. I will help you, give me time, you need to shut her down, but let me rescue all those animals first. And uh, the power of the internet, uh, it was the first time I ever did fundraising and I raised $10,000 and I start cold calling vets in Valley Center, California, which I never knew anything about previous to this, and, and I got four veterinarian clinics on board to come and when we trapped the cats, we had the Feral Cat Coalition come with 200 traps. We trapped everybody. We tested them for leukemia and AIDS, and we separated everybody out, and they got their medical care, and they all moved on to a better life. And we closed down Donna Betancourt. Uh, however, um, you know, who knows where she is at this point and what she's moved on to. But that was my brush with the animal hoarding, and, and it is a bad situation in our state. And, Unfortunately, sometimes people who do rescue, um, you know, uh, go to the dark side and don't leave, uh, let the animals go. And so there's a lot to this hoarding issue and with these people moving around the state and just simply relocating and not ever really going out of business. Um, but anyhow, um, so I left, I didn't leave rescue, but I 
went on to legislation. And so I thought, okay, you know, I want to make a difference. I can't do it one animal at a time, so I want to do a spay and neuter bill because why don't people spay and neuter when they should be? And, you know, we shouldn't have to legislate um, responsibility, but unfortunately it seems like we do sometimes. So um, I met Mr. Ed Bokes and asked him if he would want to participate in uh, a statewide spay and neuter bill with me, and he said, absolutely. <coughs> and uh, from there, we start uh, having meetings every uh, week for uh, 2006. We start meeting and with Bob Ferber and Jim Bickhart and Douglas Sell and, and started hammering out what a spay and neuter bill would look like. Right? And then we said, well, we have to expand our group because the state of California is uh, very diverse. And we start bringing in folks from all nooks and crannies of the state to come up with a spay and neuter bill. And, and that now is called AB 1634. And it's been a two year session. So in 2006, when we were drafting it, um, we also did. Uh, we had to present the mayor with a package, I, I can't remember what it's called, his legislative platform or something, uh, to get a resolution of support from the mayor and the council that they would support AB 1634 in LA could actually be a co-sponsor of this bill. So we did that and that was September 2006 and the council voted unanimously to support uh, spay and neuter, and, uh, and, and at that time, Mr. Alarcone, the council member, said, hey, well, this is a great idea, and let's not wait for the state to get this done. Let's do an ordinance in, um, in L.A., and that's how the um, ordinance track got born, which has now passed February this year. We're going to um, start enforcing it in October. So I've been a part of the Los Angeles Ordinance, uh, ordinance uh, AB 1634, the California Healthy Pets Act, uh, and uh, now other cities and counties and states across the United States are taking the lead of LA. And I'm also um, on the phone with people from different states and traveling. I went to Chicago last week. Uh, they're doing an ordinance. And um, the, the next thing that we're doing for spay and neuter is a license plate program for the state of California. And what's exciting about this is that um, the environmental license plate, which you might see out on the highway, uh, is uh, the whale tail. You've probably seen the whale tail, right? That brought in $4.5 million in one year. So I'm hoping that we even have more spay and neuter fans out there and we might even surpass those numbers. Um, so 75% of the money goes towards the cause and 25% goes towards administration. So it gets divvied up between the controller's office, uh, the DMV, and the California uh, Vet Veterinary Medical Board because they're sponsoring it. So um, then that 75% is gonna go to surgeries and it's going to go to everybody in this room and all the different groups and, and uh, city and, and county shelters. And then they can give it out, like Brenda was saying, it'll be distributed the same way that the vouchers and whatnot. It'll just be that they have so many more. So um, that's it. And I probably went way too long, so I'm sorry for that if I did. Foundation's program, as the rabbi mentioned, um, we state that we're the most successful program of our kind in the country. Uh, there are about 10 active spay and neuter uh, programs across the country um, at any one given time, but not the same 10, because they seem to have a shelf life of about three or four years and then they crash and burn because they're very uh, labor intense and they're very expensive to run. And you constantly have to keep reinventing yourself as you go into each neighborhood and try to bring people to you to understand why they want to do this because this is a free country and nobody's going to do anything they don't want to do. And so we have to want to make people understand why they do want to do this. Um, our program, uh, we focus on the very lowest income areas of Los Angeles and we also focus on the animals in greatest, uh, in our, in our, a view uh, in greatest distress, and those are the animals that are, are dying the most at the shelters. Um, the aggressive large breed dogs, 
and um, feral cats are the two um, animals that are dying the most. So we make a special effort to uh, reach over our arms and say, bring us your fractious, your aggressive, your large, your drooling, your snapping, and let us help them. Um, all of our, our uh, people who work with us are uh, passionate animal lovers. Several of them have pit bulls of their own. We have never turned away a dog because it was too aggressive or too fractious. Uh, we've worked out systems with the people, and one of the most important things about our program is to um, be very close in contact with the owner and make them uh, empower them with it. They're they're part of what we're going to do. We're going to we're going to do this together, and so that involves making appointments with them and speaking to them before they show up. Um, back one step to the, the other programs across the country. When you look at sheer numbers, our numbers last year were approximately 7,200, give or take 50 or 60 here and there, on the mobile uh, clinic. Um, that includes dogs and cats, and some 18% of our dogs were over 55 pounds. Now, when you look at those statistics across the country, there are uh, mobile programs, there's one mobile program that did in excess of 11,000 animals, but they only did cats, and they only did feral cats. So we, they were doing them in a, in a it's, it's a little easier when you're doing one size animal and you're going through and it's also much cheaper to do a, a nine pound animal as, a close, as opposed to an 85 pound animal. So our program is the only program that does the larger breed animals. We also do animals that are pregnant, crypt orchid, which means that the testicles have not fully distended, uh, descended, or in heat. This also makes the surgery more complicated and longer, and we don't turn away animals because of that. Of course, we wouldn't do anything that would in be injurious to the health of the animal, but um, if the animal is fit for surgery, then we do it. And uh, we're very many times helping people who have no other way to get their animals fed or neutered. This is a free program. We also include the rabies vaccine for the dogs so that they can obtain their city license because our new spay neuter ordinance requires that you also license your pet. We do not have licenses for cats. The cats receive a combination FBRCPC, which is the combination cat vaccine for several diseases, and the dogs receive the DHP plus P. We also, at no expense to the city, uh, deworm all the puppies and kittens under four months of age, and we also triage animals as they come into us to the best of our ability. It is not a full-service veterinary clinic. It is a spay neuter clinic, but we do um, a lot of extra on the, on the uh, mobile. In addition to that, the Amanda Foundation is the only dog and cat rescue in the second city, second largest city in the United States, being Los Angeles. Although our address is Beverly Hills, you know we're surrounded by Los Angeles, that owns its own um, veterinary hospital. So in addition to what we do on the mobile clinic, we also meet a lot of people in need and the animals, uh, the, what they need is not a spay neuter situation, but it might be some other kind of surgery. And last year we subsidi subsidized the work we did on the mobile clinic with an additional approximately $80,000 worth of free veterinary <coughs> service out of our hospital. Um, we are very in support of the new spay neuter ordinance. And as Sue said, um, it was interesting that Judy mentioned De um, Jim Bickhart and Doug LaSalle and Bob Ferber, they're the same guys that worked on the ordinance 10 years previous, and that's why the ordinances are very similar. The new ordinance has tweaked what we did 10 years ago and made it that much better, and we're very, very proud of it and want to support it wholeheartedly. Right now, the mobile clinic is not working. As uh, Mr. Bogue said, we're going into negotiations for a new contract. We hope to have it up and running again uh, very shortly because the, news, uh, the ordinance goes into um, enforcement on October the 1st. So I don't know how long it's going to take, but we are, we're ready to go as soon as, as, soon as that's signed, sealed, and delivered. Um, it, Sue was talking about actors and others becoming spay and neuter because of seeing the need of running a shelter. Uh, the Amanda Foundation started out as dog and cat rescue. Lori started out as dog rescue. You're not in rescue for 15 minutes before you don't realize that you will never, ever find homes for all of them. The only answer is spay and neuter. And the reason I was looking at, I was. I can't see from a distance that well, but I can see those big chunky numbers, so that's great. And if you look at our statistics for Department of Animal Services over the last eight years, you'll see that adoptions and redemptions have not gone up um, more than 6% over the last seven years. However, the number of animals coming into the shelters has gone down significantly. Mr. Books often uses the statistic of um, in 2001, 75,000 animals were brought into the city shelters, and last year, 55,000 animals came in, which is still 55,000 too many, but certainly a decrease. Now, if redemptions and adoptions are only going up incrementally, we know it's our aggressive spay-neuter. And so we're 
very glad that uh, Councilman Parks has always been in support of spay neuter, but I cannot emphasize enough, and the people sitting here tonight, you're all in the humane community, you all have a voice, you need to call council and tell them that this is where they have to put the money, and they have to continue to put the money there. And when Judy mentioned about, you know, the licensing of the license place, which we don't have yet, that aren't $4 million spread across California after administrative fees is not going to be a lot. We can't depend on statewide things. We really have to look at our city and see how we can zero in on our poorest neighborhoods where statistically the most animals come and help these people help themselves. So use your voices and tell them that we need more. Thank you. Lori Weiss with uh, Downtown Dog Rescue, and uh, I started off, like Terry said, rescuing dogs, working with homeless people, and then, of course, you know, we offer spay and neuter to a few homeless people, and then that grew into hundreds and thousands of homeless people over almost 12 years. Um, we target and work with probably the poorest segment in, in the city of Los Angeles, and now down into Compton. Um, working with mostly homeless people and very, very low income people that are, you know, living in their vans, living in their car, they're in transition, they're in a, maybe a um, sober living house, something like that. They either can't hold on to their dog, so we'll board their dog, we'll, we commit to their dog. You know, we can't commit to hundreds at a time, but we do our best. Most of these dogs are pit bulls. Uh, once the dog is in my program, it's spayed, neutered, licensed, vaccinated. Um, we take care of all the crisis medical care, hematoma, all that stuff for the life of the dog. And if that owner, which we've had owners die, oftentimes go to jail, go into rehabilitation themselves, we'll take that dog, whether it's aggressive, whatever it is, and it comes and lives with me sometimes for the rest of its life, <laughs> and sometimes at my house for the rest of its life. Um, and I work, of course, um, a lot with Terry and without uh, Amanda Foundation, uh, you know, our work would not be possible. Um, she is the only clinic, including stationary clinics, that can take the kind of dogs that I bring because when we do a pimp your pit or a West Coast dog or family dog or whatever, uh, I'm going out with a group of volunteers. A lot of the volunteers I have are recovering addicts. They're people that the $50 I pay them a month to pass out flyers, to take them to Nickerson Garden Bible Studies, whatever it is. It, it's a way to get the information into uh, the poorest, least informed group of people. And you're giving the people that have the the lowest voice or however you want to phrase it, they have the power to educate people that also need the information. Whereas I can't walk in and just say, okay, you're going to spay and neuter your pit bulls and everything, but they'll listen to the guy they grew up with that used to fight pit bulls and then he just used to breed them and now he actually believes in spay and neuter. And I, I train dogs at the Coliseum on Sundays, pit bulls mostly and other scary dogs um, with a bunch of men that went that route. So I know it's possible, and I think that, well, I know I've learned a lot from them, and they've certainly learned a lot from me, and they see me bring all these new pit bulls every week. And why? Because we have too many pit bulls, and it's, I think, you know, we're all in the humane community here pretty much tonight, and I think there's a lot of misconceptions of what, quote, poor people don't want to spay and neuter, and they don't understand. They understand. They really do. They don't have a car, they take the bus, they work odd hours, they have bosses that are not like me. I run a furniture factory and you know we have a very unconventional work atmosphere, but most people, if you're working at Walmart and you're told you have to start your shift, you can't say I'm dropping my dog off at a clinic. And then that clinic makes you wait and fill out forms and you know what, your whole life is filling out forms. It's, it's a full-time job sometimes to be poor. And I grew up very poor and it's like, being humiliated as a child and watching my parents fight and all that stuff and we had a German Shepherd and I can remember how much I loved that dog and we were never homeless but 
if you had to give up your dog and wait in all these lines and be humiliated. So when you come to Terry, you come to the clinic that we're doing the outreach and, and getting the word out and maybe a new area or park or whatever it is, you're treated with respect. You know, you're treated, you know, we welcome you. And I have new volunteers that will say, but that dog's coming in on an extension cord and look at the chain. I'm like, they're here, okay? <laughs> They're not good. <laughs> you know, the dog's covered in vomit and diarrhea in the back of the truck, and you're just like, it's all good. Come on, bring them on. <laughs> you know, and it's like, we'll clean them up on the truck, and that's just how it goes down. And that person really, for some of the people, they can't even go inside. They're alcoholics. They're crack addicts. You know, they're people that have phobias. Uh, it's just... You know, these are people on SSI, and they can't go to a job. It's hard for them to call. They've got a major attitude. It's all right, okay? We can we can work with the Amanda Foundation. Come on, bring it on, you know? So the program that, that I run is not just for homeless people. It's not just for poor people. It's also for very wealthy people who don't understand and who look down on all the, quote, Pitbull people and crazy people, and we're not that different. We really are not. So, uh, you know, I'm grateful that that I work with with Terry, and of course Sue's sponsored. You know, Actors and Others has helped pay for different clinics, and, and uh, you know, working together as a group. You know, coming together, different dog rescues. It's very important. So, thank you so much for inviting me. She's the only person who's doing what she's doing in the whole city, and she's she's right that we do have a lot of good groups, a lot of people sitting out in the audience. I mean, all the all the people who actually do the work work fine together, and people with the biggest most with most criticism are usually sitting at home too busy to leave their computers complaining about things. But we all know each other because we do work together, and um, and you know, so it is a good feeling, and, and there are there's a good resource here in the city of good rescue people. The uh, underlying word is passion. Each of you has a passion. And um, I was asked by somebody just before I started coming into South Los Angeles late this 